Okay. Well, this is an interesting morning. I, I did a little teaser last week. Um, <laughs> I think I was a, maybe a hair too provocative in my teaser. I said my sermon next week is called The Death of Patriarchy. And uh, when I came out of my mouth, I thought, <clears throat> this probably sounds pretty violent. And, but nevertheless, we are talking about that today. Uh, I've, re I've retooled the title of my talk from that because it's more than the death of patriarchy. It, the, the title of my talk is actually The Whole Church for the Whole Mission of God. That really is where I want to go. And let me start with just a couple of caveats before I actually get into the text today. Um, I have no idea where all of you are at on this. Uh, in a way, it doesn't matter. Um, so, here's the caveats. Number one, uh, this might be the most different sermon I've ever given. Uh, in reality, it's not even a sermon. It's probably more like a lecture on the topic. And the approach might actually bore you some, but I'm assuming that you, being adults, can actually handle it. You can do it. You can weather through. The second thing is, the topic, however, depending on your church background, might create some dissonance or affirmation, again, depending on your church background. Second, in this caveat thing, is um, in a way, much of what I'm going to share is along the lines of testimonial. Um, I, I know that there's, uh, there's some challenge in a dude standing up here talking about women, so I acknowledge the tension that that creates. Nevertheless, uh, I part of a majority of what I'm going to share is my journey and how I've kind of sorted out uh, how I stand in this issue. I'm not going to cover everything uh, to your satisfactory place. Uh, and if you're astute, you'll realize that there's holes in what I'm talking about. And if you see them, I invite you to invite me to coffee. And we can talk some more. Because that's really what it means to be a community, right? It's not it's not arriving, it's actually us moving forward and navigating stuff together. So, <laughs> and if you don't want to go to coffee with me, I'll actually buy. Uh, but if you don't want to go to coffee with me, I can actually recommend some resources that may be helpful in uh, your process and your journey. To you, uh, for those of you who uh, might struggle with the topic, maybe you, you're sitting here going, it's not even a thing. Um, that this problem of gender equality in the church isn't even something that needs to be talked about. To you, I simply say, if you're in the category of you've never experienced inequality, then good for you. God bless you. That's awesome. If you don't recognize that it's there, I hope I disturb you. As my hero, Leslie Newbegin was wont to say, every or all great thinking begins with a pain in the brain. So if uh, you're in that latter category, hopefully you'll have a little tension. So th those are all my caveats. Let's close the prayer. <laughs> Today's Pentecost. This is a this is a very very important day in the church calendar. It begins, and we're going to project this text. The story begins in Acts chapter two, and this is how it reads: When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, other languages, as the Spirit enabled them. Something radical changed at Pentecost. I know you're thinking, that is maybe the most Captain Obvious thing anyone could ever say about this text. Because the entire thing changed. A ragtag group of commoners were transformed into a company of world changers. 
a feeble, weak kneed group of women and men became bold enough to challenge the very powers of the empire. For example, James chapter 4, or James chapter 4, just after this text, um, James and John heal this guy who was a who was a disabled. Uh, this big brouhaha follows, and the, the authorities tell them, we don't want you to do this anymore, we don't want you to speak in the name of Jesus anymore, and both James and John, without flinching, say, what do, what do you think we're supposed to do? Should we obey you or God? And obviously, the story continues. They challenge the authorities that were going on. The setting is unique. I, I need to uh, frame out some context. Um, it was the annual religious holiday of Pentecost, which is the 50th week after, uh, excuse me, 50 days after Pe Passover. It is traditionally a very joyous time because it was related to the harvest. And they were celebrating the new grain of the summer harvest for Israel. Just before this event, it says in Luke chapter 24, Jesus tells his followers, I want you to wait in Jerusalem until the promise of the Father, which is the coming of the Holy Spirit. You can find that in Luke 24, 39. And it says, when the day came, they were all together in one place, and there was a series of manifestations. You can look for yourself. I mean, we can identify them quite easily. What are some of the, what are the manifestations that happened at that moment? You can talk to here. Go ahead. Give me, the, give me one, the first one. There was, a, there was this gushing wind that came in through the room, right? Enough to be noted. I mean, you can say, well, the window is open or whatever. No, this is, if you look at the text, it's, it, there's no mistaking, there's something unique about what was going on. The second one was what? Tongues of fire, which the text never tells us what it looks like. It just says there were tongues of fire that came and rested on their heads. Of course, if you Google this, you can find pictures of this. <laughs> I mean, it's common knowledge, and it looked like a certain thing. And then what was the third manifestation? They spoke in other languages. They were given a unique gift to proclaim the wonders of God in the language of the people who were there. Now, you know that there was throngs of people there, from every nation under heaven, that's what verse 5 says. People who do, did not know what to make of this unfolding drama because they heard God being declared in their own particular language. And if we were to look at uh, verses 6 and 7, there were several responses that were, were predictable, I suppose. The first thing it says in verse 6, it says that everybody who saw this happen it says that they were bewildered, or another translation says they were perplexed. Another group of people said that they were amazed, and then there was this whole group of people who kind of thought it was a charade. And what did they think happened? That the followers had been to the punch bowl too many times. <laughs> that they were all drunk. Something happened to, to incite these responses. And it all needed an explanation. So this is what happens. And we can go to the next text here, Naomi. In verse 14, Peter stood up and addressed them, saying this, Fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Know this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. He literally says this, I'm going to explain this all to you. They are not drunk, it's too early for that. But this is what the prophet Joel described long ago. What you are seeing, that, is this. The experience that you're going through right now, it is what was described would happen. That's what happened at Pentecost. It is the whole church, in essence, being released to the whole mission of God. The prophet Joel said that in the dreadful or the terrible and wonderful last days, there would be an outpouring of the Spirit on every person. It would no longer be the exclusive purview of just the select few. 
the Spirit was now available to all. This is what it says. This is the prophecy. And we'll go to the next slide here. In the last days, it says in verse 17, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men, which I appreciate them adding this, that part to this. <laughs> Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. We have to, we have to know the inclusive language in this text. If we miss this, we're going to miss the very center of what's going on. In verse 1, we read it already. Uh, it says that everyone was present, the entire community, not men over here and not women over here. It talks about this included community. In verses 4 and 17, it says that everyone, all inclusive language, was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in other languages. All people did this. And then in verse 17 and 18, we see both women and men listen, young and old, listen, even the marginalized servants would prophesy. Now we have to note this, when it uses the word prophesy here, depending on your church background, um, uh, many of us will assume pro this prophecy that's being spoken of is somebody that stands up and says, thus saith the Lord, and then predicts something. That is not necessarily what's going on here. It's not necessarily foretelling, it's foretelling. Literally, it means teaching. It means declaring the word of God. And as a matter of fact, that's what one translation says. They will boldly speak my word. So at Pentecost, the entire social order changed. It changed. The church was born. And among other things, the patriarchal cultural fetters were challenged and done away with. No more governors, no more pitch points uh, for participants who couldn't uh, join in on God's redemptive plan. The Pentecost event demonstrated that the whole spectrum of humanity, listen carefully, the whole spectrum of humanity, poor and rich, young and old, slave and free, and women and men, they were now given the voice. The voice was theirs now. That's what happened at the coming of the Spirit. It's the declaration. We're going to go deeper into this, but let me make let me make this clear. My purpose this morning is to talk about um, gender equality in the church and leadership in the church. I want to talk about that issue. So I'm going to turn a corner. Uh, just hold those texts in your in your heart for a moment. I'm going to turn a corner and move more story uh, because uh, like like all of you, all of us are on journeys to discover and figure out how we how we exist in the world, how we interact with scripture. Um, let, first, let me def define a couple terms for you. This is the lecture part, sorry. If you don't like lecture, just hold back for a moment. I'll call you back in when you're when you move more preachy. But there's two terms that are very important. There's the term complementarianism. Now, that's just a big word that says it's a view on how the church views the interaction of men and women in leadership in the church. And it, it really, uh, in a simple definition, it would be that Everybody believes men and, women are e men and women are equal, but they have different roles and functions in the church. And that would be, uh, there's a whole spectrum of understanding on that, but that would be a perspective that would say, on that side, that, that women cannot occupy certain roles in the church. Many churches say women can be elders. Some churches say women can be pastors, and so on and so forth. There's a whole spectrum of understanding in that. That would be called complementarianism. Want me to spell it? I can't. It would be probably easy. But I don't want to. Know. The second term would be the term egalitarianism. And that is a term that describes that people would just would believe that men and women are different. There is difference, obviously, but they are equal in function and role in the church. In other words, nothing's outside of the scope of what women can do in the church. If I were to create a continuum here, the complementarianism here, 
egalitarianism here. It's a little unfair because it's a it's always it's always a cheater's way to create contrasts, right, when you're talking about stuff. But there's a bit of a contrast. And there's there's people that line up in like I would say soft and hard. You know, the hard part on the complementarianism is we're passing out doilies for your head when you come in. If you don't know about that. I just, went, I just went totally church culture on you. There are churches that make women wear head covers. If you want to wear one, that's cool. But you don't have to, right? So, in other words, there's a spectrum of understanding in this. And I don't want to uh, minimize or make it simplistic, but that is, um, those are some terms that are pertinent to this discussion. Now, in my experience of faith, as many of you know, I was an outsider to the church. I didn't even, I don't know if I even went into a church until I was in my 20s. I didn't have a bad feeling about the church. I didn't have a good feeling about the church. I didn't have a feeling about the church. I was a happy pagan. I was so uh, detached from, from, from anything faith-wise that none of that stuff made sense. And so when I became a Christian, I entered the church as an outsider, and I didn't even know how it worked. Look at, look at me now. I'm standing on a stage talking to the church. What a weird comical God we serve. But I didn't know how it worked. I didn't know, I didn't know even what it was for. I didn't know any of that stuff. In addition to that, I became a Christian into a culturally conservative brand of Christianity that held pretty much a literalist, literalist view of the Bible. This is it. <laughs> This is a weird time. I, I wrote Robbie this morning. I went, okay, I have no idea if any of this is going to work. But for example, I did my under, finished my undergraduate degree at Whitworth. The world I came out of, <clears throat> I did a theology degree. The world I came out of, I came into Whitworth wondering if you could actually even be a Presbyterian and a Christian at the same time. <laughs> now I work there. <laughs> yeah, some of my best friends are friends of Presbyterians. <laughs> so, that had an impact on the way I view the world, right? All of us have a background. Nobody's coming from a total vacuum as far as understanding. Nobody. Nobody, nobody gets to be completely objective. It's impossible. So for me, that background that I, I mean, he was a Southern Baptist, and we asked if he do premarital counseling with us, and this is the summation of his premarital counseling. Ready? This is what he said. You're the head of the house, and you need to control everything. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a, and, and including the checkbook and the money. Now, this is what I this is what I assume. He didn't know me. Because if anyone would say I should handle the money instead of Robbie, doesn't know me. As a matter of fact, it made me wonder if God knew me. If that was really the perspective that I had to embrace. Because I was Hey, listen, I slept on my dirty clothes in college. I was such a wreck, and Robbie was the epitome of together. If I handled the checkbook, we would not be married today. <laughs> but, but that was the world I was, I was adopted into, where the man controlled everything. In the church I was in, women couldn't preach, women, women couldn't be elders, and women couldn't even lead worship. Unless there wasn't a guy who could play guitar. <laughs> right? And, and if there was no dude that could play guitar, we let a woman do something. And this is the other thing about my church background. I'm, I'm picking on them right now, and I, that's really not nice. Uh, but I was always astounded that women could lead men if we sent them to Africa first. <laughs> Now, if you've been at church a while and you were in my church, you're probably thinking, yeah, that's right. Because uh, women could talk as long as they didn't talk to us. Now, I didn't, honestly, I didn't feel that way, but that was the church environment that I was raised in. 
So consequently, there's all these tension points in what's going on. So if, I'll, I'll just say, I've been a pastor for a long time now, uh, 30, well, 40 years now. And there's been a process of really grappling with this stuff. So I'm gonna, this is where I'm gonna really bore you. I'm gonna read you a few things that I've written about my journey from complementarianism to egalitarianism. Quote, <laughs> I'm quoting myself, which is very weird. <laughs> There's been quite a bit of blogging done recently about women in leadership of the church. I don't want to comment much on that except to say that I'm sad to have been one late to the party of affirming full equality for women in the church. A position of non-equality simply did not make continuing sense for me as I attempted to flesh out a full-orbed theology of the kingdom of God and its hopeful consummation. And I have been forced to contend with the apt and powerful, and I'm saying that in the most biblically flattering terms, <coughs> amazing women in my life, coming face to face with the supernatural strength and grace, gifting of my wife, my daughter, and scores of other women who have invested in me. And if you go to my blog, you can see I listed a lot of them. And some of them are in this room. Danielle is on that list. Many, many women who I just go, how, how do I sort this? All who, by their grace, servanthood, and patience, challenge my complementarian view. Without saying a word, and then I put in parentheses, okay, they said a lot of words. <laughs> <laughs> Do I regret the deliberateness of my journey? Absolutely not. My commitment has always been to grapple with issues as honestly as possible. I have done that. To move beyond understanding conscience or faith is at least for me dishonest. Something I am unwilling to do. And I'm going to say this, this is off my notes. Um, that includes any issue. We cannot violate our conscience. We can only move to where we feel like we can as God entrusts us faith and the scriptures allow it. However, in accordance with my ship, I will not only nod and assent on the issue of women in leadership of the church, but I will intentionally seek out the voice of females at Emmanuel Church. I wrote this church. The church desperately needs women to lead for it to be whole and beautiful, to re represent Jesus fully in the world. And now, I got pushed back on that law. And so this is the second installment. As a result of the previous post, I was asked by an atheist friend of mine this question. Quote, not trying to be at any swear, so I won't do that for your benefit. I honestly want to know what you and other more progressive pastors do with all the verses talking about a woman's role in the church, which you might actually be wondering yourself. By the way, there's only two. <laughs> so all of them is two. <laughs> There's more, but those are the ones that give people yes. The following is at least for me a short summary of how I approach uh, these passages. While I could work directly from the key texts, the guiding issue for me is more hermeneutical, translational, or excuse me, interpretational. As stated in the prior post, a position of non-equality simply did not make continuing sense for me as I attempted to flesh out a full orb of theology of the kingdom and its hope of consummation. Let me explain. There is a thing that I call kingdom imagination. If you've been here for a while, this is not new to you. Uh, I think every sermon is this sermon for me. Most can imagine what things would look like if they were right. Even if there is some difference on what right might look like. Additionally, almost everyone can admit that things are not right right now. Poverty, injustice, crime, abuse, illness, both mental and physical. If all of those were righted, then you begin to, to land on what the Bible calls the new creation. Scripture history is a story or narrative going somewhere, sometimes inching along, sometimes forcefully, but if you buy the Bible at all, you must admit that it is going somewhere. Read Revelation 20 and 21. 
A robust theology of the kingdom must hold in tension both the now, the present reality, God's reign erupting into our life in the here and now, and the future consummation, or hope, the full writing of all things, of the bent and broken cosmos that once was perfect in Genesis. For me at that time, or at this time, it all comes down to which direction a person should read scripture. Now this is where, if you don't pay attention this next few minutes, you're going to miss how I got there. <laughs> okay? Lock in. you got about three minutes. That's all you can do. Are we to view it from the present back or from the past forward? And that's not saying we don't pay attention to the context the scripture was written into, right? That's not, I'm not saying that. We need to pay attention to that. But if we read it backward, reading it backward from here to there, one is caught on the horns of a more or less literal interpretation of scripture. You have to take everything just exactly the way it says. In this particular case, uh, text in which it appears that the Bible desires women to be subjugated to men. If one is looking forward, movie, which I believe the scripture does, moves toward the end consummation of writing all things, that would be called an eschatological, and this is probably more than you want to know, but an eschatological reading. In other words, when I read, I read where the scripture is going, not going back yeah. in the direction. Then one must read these texts regarding women through the lens of Christ and what he has and will accomplish in the future. I call this the directional life. The question that really must be grappled with is, are we to view this issue primarily through the lens of historical context of the day or through the lens of Christ and his astounding work from then into the future? In other words, uh, I'm self-admitting that there's a theology that's, that's informing the way I read these texts. And that is, the ultimate healing is not subjugation, but total freedom. And so we have to take the, the entire corpus of Scripture when we look at an issue at those two particular passages. And if you want to look them up later, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I would love to talk to you about both of those if you have questions about them. Because they're... There, there is a clear pathway on each of them. So, uh, even today we look, we kind of gloss over Acts chapter 2 and this changing of the, the, the social framework of the church. Not just, this is, again, this is not just men and women. This is everyone. Young and old. I mean, our sister who shared it, she needs a voice. She doesn't get stuck off to the side because she's in junior high. Marginalized people of any kind. This morning, though, I want to be very specific. If you are a woman, please hear me say this. You are needed, you are valued, and you are prioritized. Your leadership, your voice, is of utmost value in the value at our church. There's nothing outside of your reach. In fact, you, if, you, if you've been here for a while, you know that I've been trying to get Melissa Kuhn to take over our church <laughs> since our church started. <laughs> and you know what? I won't be here forever. And if, Melissa or someone like her, God leads us to, to bring that person on to lead, our church will, will cheer. Our ch church cannot be who we hope to be without you and your voice and your leadership. Don't go home without hearing me say what I just said. The story doesn't end. Remember I told you that I changed the, the topic to the whole church for the whole mission. If, if we had time, we could like sort our way through the book of Acts and we see example after example of how this manifested in the first church. We know 
the, the very first clarions, the very first declares of the resurrection were women. We know in the very room that we talked about as we started this text, it was full of men and women. We know that this message was to everyone. Here's a text, or here's a, here's a quote by a friend of mine, Dean Fitch, if you'll put it up here. The full release of women in ministry is not a question of egalitarian politics. That's where we get messed up. We think it's just a social issue. This is a theological issue. It is a question of releasing the church into mission. Those churches that can escape the current politics, engage in a faithful interpretation of Scripture, and make way for women in full authority for ministry alongside men will be the churches God fully inhabits to spread the gospel for his mission in the 21st century. This is what we know. As we stated already, at the very beginning, there's women. Acts, chapter 16, we find a woman named Lydia, who happened to be a church planter with Paul. She was an evangelist. And here's what you have to know. Paul ended up leaving the church and moving on. And the church was in her home. And she continued to lead that community. They didn't say, Paul's gone, there's no, there's no male cover. <laughs> Lydia, you don't get to lead anymore. We know culturally that's what happened. Having the church, this is this is actually, um, uh, I can't remember where I got this. I, I, this is a quote by somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Having the church be in one's home is one of the primary responsibilities of a pastor or an elder in the early church. Even after Paul moved on, the Philippians continued to faithfully support her. We see in Acts chapter 21, a guy named Philip the Evangelist, and he had four daughters who prophesied. Acts 21, leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed in the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. This is from Greg Boyd, uh, a link I put on the Facebook uh, page. Early Christians considered prophecy one of the highest, some argue that it was the highest, positions of the church. They did not make a clear distinction between prophets and preachers because both were, the res were responsible for speaking the word of God under the Holy Spirit's anointing. Philip's daughters are examples of women in the early church who are recognized as prophets. We move on in, um, in the, the New Testament. We see this woman named Priscilla, who was a co-minister with her husband, Aquila, who taught in the church. As a matter of fact, we see this in Acts chapter 18. It says both of them discipled a man named Apollos, who happened to be a fairly big figure. We see in Romans chapter 16, <clears throat> there's a woman named Phoebe who was actually granted the responsibility of taking the letter, the, the letter of Romans to the churches. It says she was a minister, she was a deacon in the church. Later on in the same chapter, there's this curious, curious passage where it says, in Greek, Junia, who was great among the apostles, now, there's some people who have a presupposition of what that means, like, oh, no, they just liked her. But no, the Greek does not allow for that. She was considered an apostle in the church, which was the exclusive space for men in the culture. Are you following me? We see over and over in the book of Acts that women held these roles that, that where they used their gifts, and they didn't, before they used them, they didn't go like this. Okay, hold it. Uh, are there any men here? If you're a guy, you have to go before I can use this gift. They didn't do that. Though there were cultural elements that were unique to that period that have to be paid attention to by the writers of the New Testament, because of Pentecost, the church, the whole church, was released for the mission of God. So, today, my goal is really not actually to persuade anybody. If I persuade you in some way, move the needle a little bit, great. But I don't, that, that's, not my, that's not my goal. Here's my goal. That you know where I am. And that you know where our church is. And that you are aware that this is not a microwave item that we came to last week. This has been a journey of 20 years of grappling and, and come to this resolve that this is, 
this, this is the church's role and the church's position. My conclusion was not drawn uh, just a few, a bit of time ago. I just wanted to make a clarifying statement in the light of the many voices that are still in the church that are disrespectful to women. And I am not judging anyone in the room. Who have not arrived where I am or where our church is. I, I need to tell you this, this is very important. I believe in the idea of giving space for all of us to grow and learn. Honest people, honest people are not static. We just don't, we're, we're just not locked in somewhere. We're actually learning all the time. We are not to stop learning until we stop breathing. That's so important. The people that most frustrate me are those who are unwilling to allow for that grace for others. Grace that I have received from so many others down through the years who have disagreed with me and not cast me off as somebody that couldn't be their friend. Many come up arrogantly enlightened and unwilling to have respectful dialogue around key issues, thus creating an antagonistic environment that makes everyone go defensive instead of open. I personally am grateful for the space I receive from people who have disagreed with me, and it is my intention to give that same grace to others. The reality is, though, <clears throat> the upshot of the shift in Pentecost, at Pentecost was dramatic. It says that the Holy Spirit, uh, because of the Holy Spirit and what happened at that event, there was a message for so thousands of people who became Christians. Because they were curious of what was going on. There's this there's fascinating text, and I'm close with this. At the very end of chapter 2, it says, after all of this stuff happened, a bunch of people become Christians, they're baptized, the practice the church was actually instituted, and then it, it says this, and the Lord added to their number daily such as should be saved. I believe that it was not only how they acted, and it was not only what they said that captured the attention of those wondering what was going on that day, but it was who they were. At Pentecost, the church became a truly countercultural, spectacular expression, something wholly different, literally a new community in the world. And that's because we are different together. So, let me pray. I'm going to invite Leslie and uh, the team to come back up. But I ask you, Lord, to uh, take these words and take the thoughts. And all of us are still, are, are still in a journey. We're all moving forward. We're all seeking you. I pray that we would have humility in our thinking, humility in our, humility in our actions and that we would actually move toward others. And I pray that our church would actually be reflective of the completed new creation that we read about in Scripture. Can we imagine what that looks like? I know if we read these texts right, we can join followers. It's now in Christ. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. There is neither... Greek or Jew, the, the, the race issue and the gender issue and the economic issue and every issue that separates us, we can actually move toward. Uh, even if it's just for a moment, Lord, we want to move toward a healed manifestation of what that means. Help us, guide us, fill us, Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In my tradition, the pastor called us to a position, to a, a, a place. Now we need to respond. Amen? So let's clap and thank God for Rob. Thank you for sharing the heart, challenging us, and moving us forward in Christ. So now I'd like to open this up for a time of communion and serving with me today I have a woman from Sudan and a woman from Haiti you ladies come on up 
present before the Lord and to the people. I think this is what our pastor is talking about. Yeah. And, sit. and all of us being together. Not because you have any claim on the grace of God, but because of your frailty and sin, you stand in constant need of God's mercy and help. Come, not to express an opinion, but to seek God's presence and pray for the Spirit. The, the Apostle Paul tells us, tell us that on the night on which Jesus was betrayed, he told he took the he took the bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my 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 body which is for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way after supper he took the cup saying this is this Cup is for the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it and remembers in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. 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 So let's stand for a prayer of thanksgiving. Holy Father, you sent the Holy Spirit to equip your Son Jesus for doing your will. Send now the same Spirit upon us and upon his gifts of bread and wine. Return to you from your creation. Unworthy though we may be, May the same Spirit enable us to receive them for what Jesus said they were, the body and blood for us. So receiving, may we be the more equipped to endure testing as well as triumph in our service to you. Therefore, sustain us in faith, strengthen us to love, and season us with hope as we await the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who, with you and the Holy Spirit, ever lives and rules, now, as always. Amen. Amen. This is the Lord's table. It is Jesus himself who invites you to this meal. The table is open to all who believe and have professed faith in Jesus Christ. He died for you, so feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Please come forward to partake in communion together. And most of us know how it feels. So if there's someone that doesn't know, everyone please guide people to come forward to have communion together. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 